I'm so happy to introduce you to a new friend of mine, a beautiful sister in Christ named Brianna Monique Williams. And we met online uh, discussing some of the false teachings of Word of Faith. And Brianna has such an amazing testimony and a lot to teach us today because of her background where she came out of attending the World Harvest Bible College. It's now called Valor Christian College. And it's uh, founded by a pastor you may or may not have heard of, Rod Parsley of World Harvest Church. And he was kind of like a spiritual mentor to Stephen Furtick. And we'll show you more about that as we get into this program. Uh, Brianna worked at the church as an assistant director of their television ministry. So she was right there up close. So uh, praise the Lord for opening her eyes to the truth and pointing her to scripture. And Brianna, I'm so happy that you can join me today to talk about all of this. Yes. Uh, thank you, Doreen. It's an honor to really be on this program. Your program has actually helped me a lot on my journey of finding the truth. So I was very glad for the connection. Well, so all glory to God. That's wonderful. Yeah. So 2015 to 2018, I applied for Valor Christian College and I got in and I went there. And for work study, that's how I ended up working for their television department, which is called Breakthrough Ministries. And so basically, I was at every service, but not necessarily always sitting in it. I was in the control room, sitting in the assistant director seat. So I was helping keep time of the service. But during the worship segment, I was helping cameramen decide like which instrument to get, who the lead singer was at the moment, so people can enjoy the worship experience at home online. I started out really well. I didn't do too well towards the end because I went through a lot of drama there. <laughs> it was emotionally draining and Oh, just the bad spiritual experience as well. I'm sorry, and, I'm sorry that you had that bad spiritual experience. And I just want to say that I appreciate your, your courage and your boldness in speaking out because I'm sure like me, when I talk about my, my old, you know, my past, and uh, I still care deeply about some of the people connected to the past. And, and we're not here to gossip about anyone or put anyone down. It's really about giving glory to God and pointing people to his truth, his word. Yes, very, very true. Um, before I even ever decided to speak out about anything, I was very prayerful about it because, again, like you said, I don't want to attack a person. I just want the truth to be out there because I think it's important and it's necessary. Pastor Rod Parsley is a very intelligent man. He's really brilliant and he's very well versed. What's so weird, though, is because like he loves Spurgeon. So he's always quoting Spurgeon to us. And you would think somebody who knows Spurgeon so well would be yeah. so in alignment with the truth. Yet he wasn't. Uh, because he would always say these things like you have the ability to direct divine activity. So in that meaning, like whatever you spoke out in your prayers and whatever you were believing for, you would direct God's divine ability to create and make that happen. Oh, no. And if you weren't doing that, you didn't have enough faith. Uh, see, I got potentiality. <laughs> Shut I'm going to make it. Knock some devils and some defeat and some discouragement off of me as I go. But there is a goal and I'm going to make it to the other side because I'm the seed that could. Everything God has ever done, everything God is doing, everything God will ever do, he does with a power that is already in a seed. Hallelujah. Look at somebody and tell them, my seed's oily. My seed's oily. My seed's oily. If you've got a seed in your hand, you'd like to exchange for the harvest in God. But then he would contradict himself because then he so, would talk about how you can doubt at times and that just because you believe in Jesus, you have all the faith that you already need. So but he's, he's taking faith and he's putting it into more of like a Gnostic new age yes. framework of that. We're in charge that, that we humans are sovereign, not as Spurgeon would say that God's sovereign as the Bible says that God's sovereign. 
Yeah, which is really strange. Mm-hmm. There was also like an elder there that he always referred to as his pastor, who every time he got the chance to preach was always talking about the sovereignty of God. Mm-hmm. So it was really weird how we heard like a mixture of things that were right and then things that were wrong, which even more interestingly, Charles Spurgeon said that discernment isn't the difference between knowing right and wrong. It's the difference between knowing right and almost right. It's so there was a right. lot of that going on uh, there. Rod Parsley has called Stephen Furtick his spiritual son. Could yeah. you talk about that? So basically like what Rod Parsley believes, you know, he believes in mentorship. He believes like passing on the torch and teaching other people. So there are people in ministry that he considers like his spiritual sons and daughters. And so I don't know when he started considering Stephen Furtick his spiritual son you know, maybe that was like when Elevation Church started doing really well. Maybe it had always been that case, but he calls him his spiritual son and then he's always welcome. Like they invite him to come to the Dominion Camp meeting because they know that's most likely the only event that Stephen Furtick is going to come to because that draws people like from all over the country, all over the world, even. I don't think we'd get Stephen Furtick like in a regular service. Well, there was one but, video that you sent me. Stephen Furtick mm-hmm. did, did speak at the World um, Harvest Church, right? So they, ho- they host the Dominion Camp Meeting, which is this oh, conference at World Harvest Church. Got it. So he would be on the World Harvest Church platform. Yes. Okay. So this, this clip we're going to show is Stephen Furtick speaking at the Dominion Conference at yeah. World Harvest Church, right? Mm-hmm. I love you. It is my honor that you would come and share God's word with us. Would you please welcome my dear friend, Pastor Stephen Furtick. Conversations, and you might want to have this conversation. Things like, how many kids do we want to have? I mentioned it a moment ago, but I would suggest don't even really set a number on it. Have one and see what your unique genetic combination produces before you extrapolate that decision. So like the sample, sample the sausage and then decide, do you want to buy the whole? I screwed that up. Here, here's another one. Elder Bill Canfield is like, oh my God, Furtick's having a heat stroke right in front of me because it's so sexy to say that your breakthrough is coming. But can I ask you a question? Where is it coming from? So if I'm waiting for something to come from heaven that God has already released in me, I can die waiting for what God has already given me in abundant supply. Was there pressure to to do tithe and offerings in exchange for so-called blessings? Yes. So Pastor Rod got this revelation that God will do something amazing in the body of Christ if everybody who at their local body is tithing the 10% minimum. And then if you give offerings and you're going above and you're going over, then not only is everybody going to be blessed with however they're believing God, but there's going to be this corporate blessing that's going to fall on the entire congregation. So if you were a work study student or an employee at the ministry, you could sign up to get your check to automatically give the tithe. You could have the 10% taken out. And then like for the big events like Resurrection Seed or they had prayer cloth like in the fall time and all these other events where they team up with other I, I don't even want to ask what Resurrection Seed is. Oh. <laughs> That's where you give money, believing God for this huge giant miracle and something awesome to happen. Oh my goodness. Happy. Chapter and verse, please. <laughs> Easter resurrection season. There's just simply no other season like it. And I'm overjoyed to have this opportunity to build your faith, to receive your supernatural out of season 
harvest. The resurrection seed that you determine to sow will become fruitful. It will multiply as God intended it to do from the foundations of the world. So sow in faith during this anointed resurrection season or other season like it, knowing that God is divinely positioning you for an out of season miracle. <laughs> he was really good about like taking particular parts of scripture and like twisting it and making mm. it fit, cherry picking mm. the scriptures. I don't even want to spin it how he would spin it. Very brilliant man. Do you feel like you had financial difficulties because of the pressure to give money to the church? Uh, definitely, especially in the beginning, because I wasn't going to get another job off campus because I knew me like I couldn't focus on my studies and mm. handle my work study responsibility. So uh, the way that my work study job was working, even though I had financial aid paying most of my tuition, I still had like somewhat to pay. So they were automatically taking money out of my work study check to go towards my tuition, which is fine. But then what I was left with was like $25. And then my grandparents were able to send me $25 a month. So here I had like 50 bucks a month to like live. I was supposed to get hygiene products and I was supposed to get food and like all of that off of $50. And then like, if you hear this sermon where God, well, that's how he would use his prophecy. Sometimes he would have like this prophetic word. And like, if you sowed and you tithed and you gave into this, then that prophetic word would be connected to you like that prophecy would happen for you so it's kind of like selling fortunes now that mm. i think about it yeah it sounds like <laughs> selling indulgences in the catholic church before the reformation yeah so um so yeah i felt like you know if i wasn't giving then i wasn't operating in faith it was really so, weird how well, let me st let me stop you for a minute brian and ask you because so you'd have 50 dollars, 25 of it coming from your grandparents yeah and were they wealthy or was that something that they just... No, that was like a big stretch for okay. them uh -huh. because my grandmother, she has a lot of health issues. Mm -hmm. And so most of her money goes to paying off her debt or paying towards her bills or for her doctor's appointments and her medications. So your grandparents, so your grandparents would squeeze out $25 yeah. mm -hmm. and you would have $25. Mm -hmm. And would you ever feel pressured to give that fifty dollars? Was it kind of like the, the, the parable of the woman in the church who's got yeah. the one little coin mm -hmm. she's giving? Was it like that? It was like that. It was to the point like if you didn't have the money, sometimes you felt obligated to give away jewelry that you had. In fact, I had like a friend who was less off than I was like there were times she didn't have any money at all yet she would really want to receive the blessing that God had for her so she would take off her earrings some are like fair family heirlooms mm -hmm. and she put them in the bucket because of the woman using the mic giving all that she had wow well let's circle back to the false word of faith teaching when did you start to see that what you were hearing at the pulpit wasn't what the bible says I really started with a little bit of the mixture of that prosperity gospel because word of faith technically believes prosperity gospel too. Uh, he, Rod Parsley has every Easter something he calls resurrection seed. And he talks about how the like Lord led him to do it. And when he originally did this, he was in an older building before they got the new building. And basically when people were giving money by faith, like, uh, supposedly people were being told to give hundreds, thousands of dollars. They what? just managed to earn enough money that they needed to build their new state-of-the-art mega church in the new location. Uh, so I thought that was a little weird because even though he would sometimes use scripture, that really popular one that's in Luke, like pressing down, shaking over, talking about your finances are supposed to be overflowing. I still thought it was like really weird. It was all like, why do we have to give money to be blessed by God. And I, I don't understand. And so that was one of the things that got me to question a lot. And then also the more that I served in leadership and the more people that I saw as guest ministers coming through the TV department to be on the television program and seeing some of their behavior, I'm like, if these people are supposed to be teaching us about how to mature in faith and grow in God, then why do they behave this way? Why? What, what kind of behavior did you see? Uh, so like during tapings, not so much with Rod Parsley, but 
with his daughter. Uh, sometimes she would be really short with us and just flat mm. out rude. Mm. And then she would, if anybody like messed up during a taping, she would say like we weren't prepared and that she could hire like a real crew at any time if she needed to. Um, like you, it felt like you were in Hollywood dealing with a very difficult host. Oh, and that and, ended up being what I shared about in my right. sermon is that sometimes we can miss what is because we're stuck in what was. Yeah. And sometimes it's not what the devil is doing to us that's keeping us from what God is trying to do for us. It's what God did for us in the yeah. past that we assume he's going to do in the future. Yeah. And so we miss the new people he wants to bless us through, right. the new opportunity. So when I say legacy is the wrong word, obviously I'm kidding. I think it's right. a great <laughs> thing to live for and it's biblical and you got Elijah and Elijah. And it's on the shirt, so it's too late to rebrand. So we're going with legacy, but I was trying to say that, you know, Pastor Parsley, of course, and so many other people that God has used, right. they're not in the legacy stage of their ministry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they are legendary and yeah. what they've done is legendary and certain moments in their ministry will never be recaptured and that's okay, but I think that legacy is more of a byproduct yeah. than it is an ambition. Because if I focus on what God is calling me to do right now, then what God is going to do in the future will be automatic. Like, if, I if you're really called by God and you're supposed to be doing this, then wouldn't you be doing this differently than how they do it in Hollywood? I thought what was really weird is that I had a boss once who told me, that like it was really good training ground at that TV department to go to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And he knew some people who actually ended up going and working in Hollywood. And I'm like, this is so weird that this is perfect training ground for Hollywood because you would think that because this is ministry, it's the total opposite of Hollywood. Well, yeah, because Hollywood is, <laughs> is um, very demonic, just to be blunt. Yeah. And so why would a shepherd want to send his flock to the enemy? It doesn't make any sense, like, no, whatsoever at all. That's not discernment at all. Mm -mm. You know, this is, it reminds me of a video interview I did with a woman named Melanie, who was the lead photographer for Elevation Church. And she talked about this being very purposeful about where anyone would be filmed or stand. And, and uh, as the assistant director of World Harvest Church Television, did you find the same thing, that it was very deliberate? Yes, it was very deliberate. We had to make sure that we kept our shots of the audience diverse. Diverse basically means like inclusive, like we weren't always getting the same person. We were getting a wide variety of people from all sorts of ages. We also had to be very careful about how we used that term because it could be a legal issue if we said anything like offensive, even when we were over the intercom uh, communicating with each other. And, uh, we always had to get the okay in order to capture anybody from the first family or the ministry family on camera. So like often, especially at big conferences like this, his wife would be there and his two children, his daughter and his son. And we always had to get the okay from his team that was sitting nearby, which would also kind of be the praise team. They were always expected to respond to the preaching and amen. They couldn't be caught like just sitting there doing nothing. They had to look engaged. Uh, they would tell us like, no, don't get his daughter. No, don't get his son. Oh, get a close up on his wife. She's really engaged in this moment. So we kind of had to talk to the floor director who was out there who would let us know whether or not to get the first family out as well sometimes. And even when we had an in-house photographer, that was something we had towards the end while I was there, but he always had to be mindful where he was at. He was told who he could take pictures of and who he couldn't. And, you know, when were the proper moments during altar ministry where he could get in close and get good pictures. So we always had to be super mindful. And so for someone who's watching right now, having uh, this discussion about uh, purposeful blocking on, on the camera, um, and they say, well, so what? What is the big deal about that? What does it say about the ministry? To me, it says that they care more about the reputation and how they look, and it kind of makes it feel like a more produced, fabricated experience with God than something that's actually real. Because granted, 
you know, they always had this culture of like excellence, but it was really just their way of saying perfectionism. I get that you want something to look really good and translate well on camera. And that's what they were always trying to ensure. But at the same time, like it's not appropriate because if things are really flowing with God, you can't always control things. <laughs> you know? That's true. That's a really good point. So it almost um, seems like it points to pridefulness. Would you say that? Yes, I would definitely say definitely really leans into pridefulness. And they always avoided admitting that it was pridefulness because they were saying, well, we're trying to make sure we don't negatively impact somebody's at-home worship experience. No. <laughs> we don't want them to be distracted. Yeah, it's not about me. It's about you. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really clarifying because I've had a few questions from people who watched my interview with Melanie about uh, her photography of Stephen Furtick. And, and to me, it was obvious that that's what she was saying, but I guess a lot of people didn't pick up on that. So I really appreciate you clarifying that pridefulness is a sin, especially in uh, an elder and a pastor. Uh, and uh, we all have, we're all sinners, of course, we all probably go into pride, but um, just that deliberateness and then denying it instead of repenting from it um, is, is something, it's a red flag. Yeah. Definitely. In, and even like sometimes there were moments like in chapel services because they were a little bit more lenient in chapel services with what you caught on camera because they had a lot of students volunteered to be the camera people. And obviously they didn't want the students to have such a terrible experience that they quit ever volunteering to run a camera. But uh, especially in that, sometimes like the leadership would get up there and a student was like quit serving in an area because of how they were being mistreated. And, you know, they would kindly say that God called them to another area because, you know, Christians mm -hmm. have all learned how to do that white lie, you know, because yeah. you don't want to outwardly offend anybody. It's like, oh, God is calling me somewhere else. When the truth is, you don't want to talk about why you're going somewhere else. Like, yeah. you're being mean to me. I don't like this. And this is why I'm leaving. But the leadership would say that, they would kind of bully them with, you know, some of the false doctrines that they believe, like, you know, that you're called and you know that it's tough and you know, you shouldn't have left. Like that was all on you. And they would make you feel really bad. Like you're being disobedient to God because you stopped serving in an area of ministry, which that's kind of like another thing. World Harvest Church right now is so dependent on Valor Christian College students serving and even the areas at World Harvest Church apart from the college. Like the students are in the children's ministry, the students are in the media department, the students are helping out with the first family prep for services and be ready for the day. The students are cleaning the sanctuary and they're cleaning the building. Wow. So what do you think about that? I think, like, I understand they say they want to train them and teach them for ministry, but at this point, it's, I feel like they're taking advantage of the students. Like, if the ministry was doing so well, then wouldn't you have people who attend the church serving in all of these areas? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, members of the congregation volunteering rather than having the students um, mandatory doing this work. Yeah. And then what I thought really interesting is that I had some friends that ended up like working directly for the family that started the ministry for the Parsleys. And they would never talk about like what they witnessed or what they saw or what they experienced with them. But like their whole demeanor would change. They would go from like loving the first family before they ever working with them to like, I can't wait to get away from the first family and they're not all that they're cracked up to be. Mm -hmm. And so like you could tell that something was going on within the first family that probably only those people know to this day. And the only reason why nobody is saying anything is because they believe that if they speak out against the first family, then they're speaking against the anointing and that something bad is going to happen to them because they're speaking against God's delegated authority. The so it ones. Uh, are you referring to a lot of Word of Faith teachers and NAR teachers say, touch not the anointed, which yes. goes back to Second Samuel, which was mm -hmm. a specific instance where David was not going to harm Saul, King Saul, who had been anointed by God through Samuel. 
And it has nothing to do with modern day people, or, or especially these false prophets. And so were they using that? They definitely use that all the time. Like you shouldn't be going around talking about God's anointed or your leaders. They'd be like, and you better stop talking about your leaders because you're coming against God's anointed. And that is just not going to work out for you. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. But that's essentially what they would do to us. And so instead of putting the fear of God in you, they'd put the fear of the so-called first family in you? Yes. Yes. There was a lot of fear of man going on. Like it got to the point where like, instead of me trying to do the right thing because I wanted to honor God, I was like, I should do this because this will make the leadership happy with me. Mm. Uh, If I don't do this, then the leadership is going to have a problem with me. And you know, that's not the right frame of mind. No, no. Galatians 1.10, we're to be God pleasers, not people pleasers. Exactly. Huh. Oh, wow. So how was your life while you were in the thick of being under word of faith preaching? Uh, It was weird. I really think that how Stephen Furtick does ministry, because I've watched the videos where you interviewed the two people that worked there and volunteered there, that he basically kind of like learned his blueprint, how to do ministry from Rod Parsley, like from the praise section. There's technically a praise section at World Harvest Church. Like the ushers are told to pick out people that not only are dressed well, but these are people that are known for being engaged with the services from the worship to the sermon so that the cameramen up front have good people to capture and put on camera if that's necessary, if that's something you want to go for. They kind of gone away from showing people on camera because it's not cool or popular anymore. Um, But then even to how like where Stephen Furtick placed his cameras at Elevation Church, the main campus that he preaches from, there was a person at World Harvest Church who was thinking about going to work there, or at least he that person tried to go work there, but World Harvest Church stopped it because they needed him at World Harvest Church. Like they couldn't function without this person. But he went and toured and he noticed like, even though that they had state of the art automatic cameras and not really like a lot of cameramen, like where they chose to place them was very similar to the setup at like World Harvest Church. The fact that Stephen Furtick is treated with like the celebrity type status and that, you know, only his inner circle can get close to him. That's exactly how like Rod Parsley had been doing things for years. Like only his inner circle has access to him. And basically him writing the books, you know, having these bestseller books. Uh, that's something that Rod Parsley was like really, really good at even to how like getting people to volunteer and like help for the services, you know, Stephen Furtick's design and setup for that is really similar to Rod Parsley. It's now gotten to the point that Stephen Furtick is getting so creative that Rod Parsley started taking from Stephen Furtick, like World Harvest Church decided to redo their whole stage. And that's because Rod Parsley was really impressed with the main church campus that Stephen Furtick had in his stage and his auditorium they in time want to like switch out the seats that are at World Harvest Church to kind of match what's at Stephen Furtick's church. But just that connection, you know. A lot of of influences. Mm -hmm. Um, You had also mentioned that Steve, you had also mentioned that Stephen Furtick's father was connected to Rod Parsley and World Harvest Church and Bible College. Could you talk about that? Yeah, so I don't really know too much about Stephen Furtick's father's direct connection, but I know that Stephen Furtick's father definitely listened to Rod Parsley because that's something that Stephen Furtick talked about when he came to preach at World Harvest Church. He mentioned that listening to Rod Parsley was something that they did together. And he shared this really touching story at a Dominion camp meeting once that when his father was passing away with ALS, that they sat and they listened to Rod Parsley's sermons um, as he was passing away. And then, you know, Stephen Furtick sang him some worship songs that Stephen Furtick had helped write. So like, you know, every parent, especially if they're close to their dad, like really wants to honor their dad. So I can only imagine that being connected to Rod Parsley is something that's really special to Stephen Furtick. I mean, he interviewed with Rod Parsley's daughter talking about how like, 
you know, he considers Rod Parsley like a legend, you know, and, and if there wasn't Rod Parsley, then he wouldn't kind of be doing what he was doing because he was a young man, 17, 18 years old, listening to cassettes of Rod Parsley's pre like One minute I'd be like on cloud nine because I believe God's going to do this great thing. And then this great thing didn't happen. So then I'd be very low and like very sad and very down and very bleak. And then it started getting to the point where like, I had a lot of doubt. Like, I wasn't sure. Was I hearing from God? Was I not hearing from God? Because like, I would have this moment where like, I feel like God is speaking to me, but then I crack open a Bible and I can't find anything that connects to what I felt God told me (laughs) or like what I heard the pastor say. I was like, that doesn't, that doesn't, that's not really what this scripture is saying. (laughs) Well, praise God that the Holy Spirit was helping you by illuminating the scripture and showing you that it doesn't line up with Word of Faith. And I'm so sorry that you went through the false hope and that I'm just glad your faith wasn't shipwrecked. I'm sure you've seen people who've left the faith because those so-called promises didn't come true. Yeah, so specifically, uh, I decided like a few weeks ago to like, go public on social media with my experience at Bible college. And I got some people who messaged me who talked about, Oh, I thought I was the only one. I felt that Mm -hmm. way too, while I was there. And like, now I'm not even like following God. Like I'm afraid to, or like I'm angry at him. So So people wrote to you. I just want to clarify. So people wrote to you and said, yeah, they messaged me on social media Mm -hmm. and they were saying that, you know, they don't go to a church, they won't pick up a Bible, they won't even pray, they're angry with God, Mm -hmm. or they're afraid to connect with God. Like, if you're getting the proper teaching, and you're learning how to mature in faith, like nothing should ever give you an experience where you want to turn away from God, you'll just want to run closer to him. The word of faith pastors, it's like they're trying to guarantee miracles from God. And that's just false hope. That's, that's, that's not biblical at all. Yeah. So Rod Parsley has this saying that expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles. So he wanted people to show up to a church service expecting God to do a miracle. So I had friends, you know, were believing for unsaved loved ones or like they were having like serious health issues of their own where they needed a miraculous healing or they were dealing with a certain sin that they needed deliverance from. And so they were always going to a service like expecting to get delivered and get set free or you know for the miracle to happen and it really didn't happen that often and so then with a lot of the other teaching that they give that like your faith and what you're believing makes makes the miracle happen or it doesn't make it happen so like if your faith isn't strong enough if you're not believing it and you're not receiving it that's another thing that he would say if you're not believing it and not receiving it it's not going to happen so then it makes you go like well god i'm here and you know most of us were serving in an area that we weren't even that happy to be serving with but we were told that this is where god has put us so it's like i'm doing something i don't even like doing i'm in a place where i'm going through all this chaos oh and the way that they explain the chaos was that they had another term that when you're serving God, you have a target on your back. Mm -hmm. So it kind of like mentally prepared you that you're going to constantly go through a battle and constantly go through a hard time. I mean, there's some truth to that, but probably not not in the way that they're describing. I mean, the believer goes through hard times simply Mm -hmm. because we believe in God, not Mm -hmm. because you're specifically stepping in to a particular calling and you're doing a specific thing they kind of like make you put your calling and what you're supposed to do in the body of christ kind of like as an idol to have you put that like Mm -hmm. right up there and then they make it seem like they're the gatekeepers like the only way that you'll get to your calling in life is if you serve at this place while you're here (laughs) so you're already just mentally and emotionally in this hard place so when you don't see that miracle happen from god you go oh god must not really love me or Mm -hmm. i must be messing up i'm not doing something right i'm not doing something proper so it's just kind of the way how they take they're really good at taking like the blanket statement of truth and like twisting it a little bit like another thing that they would commonly say is that you know obedience is the key to unlocking god's blessings which that's not really a lie like we can see in scripture when you're obedient to god you do get blessed but they kind of make it seem like the only way you're going to get that blessing 
And the only way you're really being obedient is if you're serving the anointing and that you're doing everything you can to serve in this place and oh, honor wow. these people. This has been so eye-opening, Brianna. And I just, I can tell that you really care about people's salvation, about their souls, about pointing them to scriptural truth. And is there anything else that you would like to say to people watching this video? Yes, basically, like at the end of the day, the only person responsible for your relationship with the Lord is like technically you. Like, yes, we should have spiritual teachers in our life that are teaching out of the Bible, but you can make sure that you're under that by being in the Bible yourself. Like God took hundreds of years and he used a whole bunch of human beings to compile and put this Bible together for us. And I think it's kind of crazy that it's so easily accessible to us in the free world, yet we would not turn to that. Instead, we would first turn to like a worship song that makes us feel good. Or we would rather go on social media and listen to somebody preach the house down instead of like going to the word to find comfort or even just praying in our own words to God about like what we're feeling and what we're going through just to wait on the Lord for him to comfort us. So I definitely say that you should find a congregation that is teaching the truth and you definitely need to find people to grow with and have community because that is biblical and that is what God wants. But at the same time, at the end of the day, you need to know the word if you live in the free world so that you can have a good relationship with God. Amen, sister. Thank you very much for being here today, Brianna. And of course, you can contact Brianna. We've got the links below to her social media and her blog.